grab on to it and pull on it real tight and pull down harder. Pull. All right, keep going. Keep going, keep going. Good job. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Luna. Thank you. That must be yours. Mine's right here. Oh, I'm going to put this up there.
one spirit. There is one hope in God's call to us. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Living Lord, whose love displaced the gravity of the stone, you entrusted women who loved beyond death with news of the resurrection. We praise you for the open gospel which ends where Easter faith begins. Accept our fear, our disbelief, and take us into this new world led by your risen Son. Through Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the dead. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter began to speak to Cornelius and the other Gentiles. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Psalm 118. Please read the gold print. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim, His mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. There is a sound of exaltation and victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord has triumphed. I shall not die in the and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has punished me sorely, but he did not hand me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. He who is righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and I have come by salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. A reading from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received in which you also stand through, which also you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, 
most of whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles. I'm fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thank you, God. God. spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. God who turns death and stench into life and beauty. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Alleluia. Christ is risen. <laughs> good. It is a good morning, isn't it? What's good about it for you? What makes it a good morning for you? We're here in person, right? sun is shining. I haven't been in this pulpit since Ash Wednesday, two Ash Wednesdays ago. So It's Easter, we're in person, the weather's gorgeous, there are flowers coming up outside of the church. I hope I'm not trying to talk you into it. Sometimes I need to talk myself into it, but I hope you have a grateful heart and that you are able to see divine blessings all around you. What Easter memories do you have? What nostalgia enshrines this day for you? Do you have strong memories? Please, share them. What memories do you have of Easter in general? Well, I'll start as nobody else wants to. I was talking to other Christians earlier. In my memory, 
remembrances for many, many years, probably the 70 years plus that I've attended here. Uh, crowds of over 120 people on this year in this little church. Uh, perhaps it's good that we don't have that many today. <laughs> good. The roof would go up and down. <laughs> Other memories? Of your childhood for Easter? Anything? I'd say the same thing, just the fact that church is always packed on Easter. You're always looking at the hats that the ladies yeah. wear, and lots of kids and lots of excitement. Yeah. Kids are all hopped up on the sugar and the chocolate and candy, right? Yeah. Other memories? Well, I can't believe as a teenager uh, in Ohio, I would get up and go to see the uh, sunrise service. <laughs> You wanted to, or you you were made to? Well, I wasn't really made to. Okay. I, I guess. Hmm. Good. Stale peeps. Stale peeps. Were they already stale by Easter? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. I always got to wear a brand new good clothes. Yeah. And after church, I'd all go and uh, go in the backyard with the grandkids and kids and have Easter egg hunts. Yeah. I didn't get any new clothes. <laughs> I didn't either. But I remember my pants were always itchy on Easter. Yeah, they did. Yeah. <laughs> and it is wonderful, or it used to be, when the ladies would be all back down in their Easter bonnets and thank you, Lord, for doing that for us. <laughs> That's right. Well, good. I remember the smell of my Easter basket. The smell of the candy, the feel of that plastic grass from the nest in the basket, digging through it to try to get a stray jelly bean and not eat any of that plastic, the taste of malted milk balls. I remember going to church every Easter of my life with the exception of last year. I remember yellow daffodils, my mom's baked ham, mashed potatoes, homemade crescent rolls, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents. These memories are strong memories. I can remember sounds and conversations, but the smells still fill my nose and my mind. I hope that you also have these types of memories that if you can't remember them now, that later on they will pop into your head like an old friend stopping by. If you don't have any fond memories, I pray that God may give you experiences on which to build new memories. Because these moments, these memories are special, maybe important. We like good memories, don't we? Memories of laughter, of good days and good mornings. Days that we can be grateful. Days where life seemed to be turned up to ten all the way. Days of the birth of our children, our grandchildren. Best days with friends and family who have now been gone for a long time or a short time. Memories of life. And adversely, our memories of death and mourning are just as strong, aren't they? Memories that can still pull us down into the darkness and fear and pain. Memories that may be filled with similar smells. Comfort food, ham, potatoes, lots of meals, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents. The death and funeral of a beloved grandparent or spouse. Do you have these memories? Can you also remember those not-so-great memories? Can you remember voices, conversations, maybe a comforting word or phrase, maybe an insensitive and infuriating comment? Are there smells associated with these memories for you? Smells of death, perhaps, hospitals, nursing homes, or another residence. 
Sit with those memories for a minute too. Which ones are the strongest? The good memories or the bad memories? Life and death, birth, baptisms, funerals, burials, mystery. This is the story we have today from Mark, right? Mark is filled with sounds and smells and tactile elements. A constant reminder that Jesus was born just like you and me. No virgin birth narrative in Mark. No birth narrative at all. Jesus felt all of the feels, encountered any and every human emotion, not because he was divine, but because he was human. Mark does not claim that Jesus was God, only that he was remarkably human, the Son of Man. No miracles. Mark refers to the healing stories as deeds of power. No superhero stuff in this gospel. The humanity of Jesus is the focus. Remember that as you think about this text from today. But as you heard this text read a few minutes ago, I hope it piqued your interest. One of the downsides of the pandemic is that it became very difficult to follow the liturgical calendar for many of us. Is that right? Did you, did you know it was Lent? Maybe not. It's hard to imagine. Unless you went to another denomination, you may not have heard the words or experienced the liturgy of Monday Thursday, the foot washing, the stripping of the altar, sitting in the darkness. You missed Good and Holy Friday, maybe. You missed the text of the anguish and the pain, the passion of Jesus. You missed the torture and death. And you missed, perhaps, the great vigil of Easter last night, the service after the setting of the sun that brings us from Holy Week into Easter, from darkness to light, from death to life. These three services are known as the Triduum and are the most special and important services that Christians have. And maybe you watched them on the Church of the Holy Trinity YouTube channel. Maybe you followed along. If so, then Easter will have a more effective whiplash feel. It is hard to experience Easter unless you go through Holy Week. But if you missed it, don't go back to watch it. We're now in Easter. Don't go back to death. But put it on your calendar for next year. These stories explain the significance of the story of these two Marys and Salome from today. This account of the empty tomb is my favorite of the four Gospels. I love it that these women are identified by name, that the author makes a point to identify these disciples to make sure they are not forgotten, and to contrast the response of these disciples, the Marys and Salome, compared to the, re the response of Peter, the denier, and Judas, the betrayer. Faithful disciples as opposed to disciples who had betrayed Jesus. These three women are the only ones who are willing to tend to the body, to risk being seen heading to the tomb of their friend who had been crucified and killed by those in power. While the rest of the disciples are hiding in fear of the Romans, and the religious authorities. And they're willing to confront the reality of what has transpired, aren't they? To accept and mourn the death of Jesus, to go and anoint the body of Jesus for his final resting in the cold tomb, to push through the smells of death and a rotting corpse, to wash and clean the body, unwilling to have their last memory be of him in excruciating pain on the cross, but as they walk in their grief, one of them realizes that they have a problem. How will they move the stone from in front of the carved out rock and tomb? This rock was meant to keep animals out, right? To keep grave robbers out. Would they be able to move it on their own? 
Might they be able to find someone to help them near the tomb? They didn't know for sure, but they knew they still needed to go. They knew that somehow they would figure it out. They would make a way to roll away the stone and then to roll it back. They had accepted death. They had started to take care of the business of death, to encounter the harsh realities of death, to look death in the eye. And as they arrived, they must have been terrified and angry. Had someone moved the rock? Had they stolen the body of Jesus? Had others desecrated the tomb in the body? Was it the Roman Empire? Was it friends or neighbors who were angry about the heat that Jesus brought to their community? Who would do this? And what might they have thought as they arrived at the opening of the tomb, as they peered in, as they saw a young man who was most definitely not Jesus? What might they have been feeling at that point? What a reversal. They expected the stench of death, but instead found none. And now, what might it have been like to try to process what you were hearing from the young man dressed in white? If this was true, what would that mean? What would it mean about the experiences they had had with Jesus? What would it mean for those who loved and cared for Jesus? What would it mean for those hiding from the Romans in their homes, worried about others lashing out at the followers of Jesus? What would it mean? What would it mean for the future? No way that they could go backward. Would Jesus just continue with his ministry? Would he be angry with Peter? Would he be back for retribution? Would he lead an uprising? Not to mention that death is death and life is life and they have very little in common. What does all of this mean? And all of these questions must have flooded their minds in the blink of an eye, washed over them like a flood or like drinking from a fire hose, an impossible task to process this information. They saw his lifeless and bloodied body just a few days before, the breath beaten out of him. And like other encounters with angels, with young men in white, this one tells them not to be alarmed. Don't be alarmed? How could they not be alarmed? This is more than upsetting, more than earth-shattering, more than mind-blowing, more than paradigm-shifting. In fact, it was so trauma-inducing that they did not follow the instructions. They did not relay the message to Peter and the others. Instead, it was now their turn to go and hide in terror. Perhaps not in fear of the Roman Empire, but instead in fear and amazement of a God that would raise humans from the dead. A God who would roll away the stone and act in, distribu in uh, distributing justice when it seemed impossible. And so this is the question for these women, these disciples. Are their memories memories of life or are they memories of death? Are they memories of sweet Easter candy or the stench of rotting flesh? Will their memories be memories of fondness and share these common realities with all who knew him or bury them deep because it is too brutal to talk about? How will they remember this story? And I suppose this is the case for you and for me too. What will we do when this story of death is reversed and turned into life? Will we be terrified? Amazed? Both? I wonder. When we see injustice in our community and in our region and in our state, when we see injustice in our country, when those on the margins are victims of an unjust system that executes the weak and those who stand up for justice, how will we respond? When we see global suffering and poverty and war, what will our response be? As an individual, as Episcopalians, 
as Christians, as Americans, how will we respond to injustice with the knowledge of resurrection? And maybe more important than our memories of these things is how we are remembered. How will the weak, the widow, the immigrant, the orphan, the LGBTQ community, people of color, how will they remember us? Will it be the sweet smell of Easter or the smell of death and Holy Saturday? My prayer for this parish, for you individually, for me, is that the smell of Easter flowers and Easter baskets and the smell of the Easter ointment that Mary, Mary, and Salome carried, meant for the dead, will be able to be smelled far and wide to those who need to smell it the most, that the living will smell all the smells of life. So may your smell the odor you leave behind be a memory that lasts for an eternity in the nostrils of Manistee County. Happy Easter, church. Christ's body is not here. You are now his body, and only you can carry out his work. May you be picked and possessed and anointed by the God of love who rolls away stones and brings life even out of death. Amen. vows with me. Through the Paschal Mystery, dear friends, we are buried with Christ by baptism into his death and raised with him to newness of life. I call upon you, therefore, now that our Lenten observance is ended, to renew the solemn promises and vows of holy baptism, by which we once renounce Satan and all his works and promise to serve God faithfully in his holy Catholic Church. Do you reaffirm your renunciation of evil and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ? I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Son of our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was the crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He descended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of the bread and in the prayers? I will go with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will go with God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will go with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will with God's help. May God Almighty, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and bestowed upon us the forgiveness of sins, keep us in eternal life by his grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world. For our bishops, Michael, our president. For our bishops, Michael, our presiding bishop, for the standing committees of Eastern and Western Michigan, for Skip, our assisting bishop, for our partner diocese and their bishops, Connie, Bishop of Michigan, Rayford, Bishop of Northern Michigan, Craig, Bishop of Northwest Lower Michigan Synod of the ELCA. We pray for all those in our diocese who are discerning calls to ministry, both lay and ordained. In particular, we pray for those in our diocese who are preparing for the sacred order of priests, including Jonathan, Alicia, Joe, Natalie, Jay Barrett, Alex, Derek, Catherine, Rebecca, Matt, Del, Joanna, Kurt, and Anne-Marie. We pray also for those in our diocese who are preparing for the sacred order of deacons, including Joy, Trish, Mark, Jim, Michelle, Matt, and Linda. For this gathering, our clergy and elected leaders, Christian and Jody. Our vestry and their officers, Susan, Mike, Carol, Corey, Jamie, Jim, and Mary. We pray for the mission and ministry of the Diocese of Western Michigan. We remember with gratitude the retired clergy of the diocese. We pray for the mission and ministry of St. Paul's Corona, Russ Merrill, priest in charge, St. Timothy's in Richland, Joe Termo, rector. We pray for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of Him. In our parish cycle of prayers, we lift up Lali Acuna, Susan Alexander, Chris and Kim Anderson, and Simon Bush and Reggie Asquith, the families we serve at the Baby Pantry, and all who use this space to bring about beauty and healing in your world. Pray that they may find and be found by him. Remember Wayne and Dana. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for those in need of healing, especially Wes, Phyllis, Dale, Hope, Tom, Marty, Eileen, John, Tom, Nathan, John, and Candy, and all those who have asked for our prayers. We give God thanks for those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. Look with favor. We pray on your servants, Susan Mancarelli and Janine Fitzgerald, as they begin another year. And we thank you for the love and witness of those beginning another year of married life. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace be with you. Peace, everybody. Peace, Larry. Peace, peace at home.
welcome you officially to the Sunday of the Resurrection. Christian and I are so pleased and honored to be able to be your priests and to be back in person, like I said. The protocols that we have in place for being church in the midst of the pandemic are listed in your bulletin. And um, if you could just take time to familiarize yourself with that, we're going to, I'm sure, need to be reminded in the weeks to come about how to do this. <laughs> It's really important now that we are meeting in person again that you sign up for the service, especially with our capacity limitations in place. We all need to do our part and communicate so that our leadership teams can plan. The link for that sign-up is going to live on our website and be shared in the weekly e-blast that goes out on Fridays. If you have trouble accessing it or signing up for it, please don't hesitate to call Christian or I or Colleen you can also send us an email. We're happy to help. I think that's it for now. Please know that at this church there is no one who is ineligible or unwelcome to celebrate Eucharist at God's table. Our altar is the table of our loving God. The table set to feed all of creation through the love of Jesus Christ. You who are a part of that body are most welcome, indeed, invited to partake. For those of you joining from home today, when it comes time for communion, because you can't be here with us in person, we invite you to pray, pray the prayer of spiritual communion, which we've included in the bulletin on page 16. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all.
time for communion, I will bring the bread to you so you can just stay put in your seats because there's not really a way that we can maintain social distancing while communing up here, okay? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up our hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels, and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Become subject to evil and death. You, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, Almighty God, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we serve a loving God and therefore are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Alleluia. with thanksgiving.
page 16, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to sin, into true and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.